Yo, what's up, everybody? All two or three of you watching right now. Probably most of you guys are going to watch this on uh, replay, which is absolutely fine. Uh, me and Mr. Brown TV or Speaker's Corner, or whatever uh, his name was, have been trying to schedule this debate since, I believe, April or May. Um, and due to scheduling conflicts, both on my end and on his end, uh, we've been unable to do so. Uh, and I just received a message uh, like a minute ago that uh, apparently he is at work until 8 p.m. his time, even though he said that he'd be fine with today at this present time. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and scrap any hope of having a discussion with him on this. But since I scheduled it, I figured we would uh, at least go through a little bit of some of the stuff that I have prepared for the debate. So I'm sorry. If you're expecting a debate, uh, I was as well. It was really going to be more set up as like a discussion. Um, but the topic is the divine Messiah. So he had um, reached out to me <clears throat> and challenged me to a debate to say, look, nobody, um, the Old Testament does not expect the Messiah to be divine. And he asked me if I wanted to have a discussion on this particular topic. Uh, I agreed to do so, and uh, so I've got a, quite a few things uh, prepared for the discussion. It's not necessarily a debate style, which I'm more familiar with and more comfortable with, uh, but I did prepare kind of an opening statement uh, just to get the conversation started. Um, so for your entertainment and educational purposes, we will get started. Um, and to that, I apologize. Um, I wrote it on notes, so I'm not going to be staring at you directly through the camera. I'm going to be uh, looking down at my sheet of paper. Um, if anybody is here and they want to have, uh, if they want to join or they want to ask questions or anything like that, I will be as interactive with it as I possibly can be. However, before we get into any of that, what I do want to do is talk about a couple of Christian brothers who are in need um, one of them is Chris Claus, which you guys have, um, I've done quite a few live streams with him. Uh, he and his family have just kind of fallen onto some uh, difficult financial times. Uh, I think there's some health issues going on with some of his family members. I don't want to get too in depth with this stuff, but he um, is asking for our financial help. So what I'm going to do is post into the chat his community page. Um, and if you just scroll through that, you will see a way to donate if you're capable of doing so to help he and his family out. At the same time, um, <clears throat> there's another brother who I've spoken to on Clubhouse. I don't think we've done any live shows together. His name is James is tired is his thing. I'm also going to post his community page in there. Uh, so that if you're capable of donating, uh, to to them to help them and their family out that would be amazingly fantastic um, so I put both of those in the chat so if you're watching this on replay just check the chat it's like the the second or third um, message in the chat so without any further ado and hopefully with some degree of entertainment we will jump into the uh, hey Chloe what's up uh, hey, Mel, what's up? Um, we will jump into the divine Messiah um, argument that I was going to lay forth so that we could have this invisible discussion that apparently we are no longer going to have. But like I said, if anybody wants to add anything in the chat or if they would like to um, ask any questions, I'll do my best to field and answer those questions as we go along. So this is what I had prepared. So hindsight is <clears throat> 2020, and this is typically and almost always true regarding prophecies as well. So Jesus tells his disciples, he says, um, go and check the scriptures because they testify about me. Obviously, the, te the scriptures of that time were what we consider to be the Old Testament. He says something exactly like this or similar to this. In John chapter 5, 39, Luke 24, 27, Luke 24, 44, and John 5, 46, and probably elsewhere, but this is what I was able to find. So here's the thing that Jesus laid out. What do the scriptures say uh, about 
those prophecies, how those prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus, and also what do they say about the nature of him as the Messiah. So we're going to go to the beginning because the Bible is one continual story from beginning to end. So let's start at the beginning. And like any good story, the beginning is essential for proper understanding of what's going on throughout the entire saga. The Bible is written in no different way than that. So this is what Genesis does. It sets up the entire premise and it provides major clues and foreshadowings for how the story will go and how the story will eventually end. Genesis lays out the framework. So in Genesis, we meet God, who is, of course, the main character. In the story, God creates everything. He orders everything, uh, and he considers it to be all good. Uh, at the end of that story of the creation, he creates mankind, so enters in mankind as one of also the main characters, right? So God uh, creates mankind uh, and establishes us, men, uh, and women, I'm just saying it in general, as the agents that can actually participate alongside with him uh, in keeping order. He gives us the order to keep order, essentially, um, within this particular world. And in the story, we also meet a third character. We meet the adversary, right, who we know as the devil or Satan or Beelzebub or whatever other names you want to ascribe to him who is the instigator, right? The adversary, the instigator of what the drama, the real life drama that we are all living that has been happening since the beginning of the universe. Um, he instigates that drama. <clears throat> we read in Genesis, uh, basically chapter one, and I'm going to focus on chapter one through three, that the character of God is very unique in that he is referred to in both a singular form and also in a pluralistic way. So we read in one passage where God refers to himself as us and our, right? So there's a pluralistic understanding of who God is. And in the very next verse, he basically says the exact same phrase in which he's using, but he uses he um or his, right? It's, it's referring to him as in a singular, singular way. Um, <clears throat> a similar statement is also made about mankind, specifically about men and women, right? So in, in one sense, we've got Adam, who is a single person. And in another sense, we have Eve, who is also a separate person. Uh, but God says that they are united and they become one flesh. In the Hebrew, that word is Ekad, which later we find out in Deuteronomy, is also the word referred to to state that the Lord your God is one God, or it says Ekad, right? So we can actually understand this phrase of Ekad to mean one or a, a unit or a, a unity. Um, and we can easily understand that when we think about man and woman coming together in marriage, uh, and those two persons are um, essentially one one thing essentially <clears throat> so the oddity so this is kind of odd right it's odd to think of two different persons or multiple persons being one particular uh thing so this oddity is important for us to know how to understand the story and we're going to get more and more revelations about this particular oddity and how it is that we are supposed to understand both this singular understanding of, of who God is, but also in the pluralistic way. So here's how the drama begins, right? So the adversary, the serpent, Satan, um, he convinces Eve that it's a good idea to disobey and rebel against God. Both she and Adam participate in this rebellion and then are cast out into the wilderness of chaos. The problem is, uh, of this rebellion, uh, of this uh, disobedience, what, what this is called, it has a name. The name of it is sin. And it is a problem because sin, as we see by the separation between God and mankind, separates, well, God from uh, mankind, or more, more properly put, mankind um, from being able to enter into the presence of God. <clears throat> The rest of the journey of the Bible, 
as we read through it is essentially uh man it's it's about mankind's effort to rectify their relationship with god and god's interaction with mankind in that rectification man's very first attempt after the sin you guys probably all know this is to co is to attempt to cover their own sins right this is represented when adam and eve feel shame they try to hide from god for the first time and they try to cover their nakedness they can cover their shame with fig leaves <clears throat> later we realize that this is unacceptable to god and then the first foreshadowing we see is right there written in Genesis chapter 3 of how God is going to rectify that relationship break and how he's going to over, overcome or help us essentially overcome our sin problem. So how he does this is he, even though Adam and Eve are covered, they're covered by their own efforts and fig leaves, God actually covers them in animal skin. So essentially he says, your first covering is no good. I'm going to cover you with the animal skins, right? So this is a major foreshadowing as to what continues to progress uh, throughout the Bible. Now I can get into a lot of different things and I can get into it later if you guys are interested in it. Um, <clears throat> but we see over and over again, and especially most of my audience is pretty literate with the Bible. You guys can think about a lot of different examples where God is the one who provides the sacrifice. God is the one who is the savior in this sense. <clears throat> so over and over again in the Old Testament, um, God tells us about blood sacrifice and how that it, it is the best way of atonement. It's the best way to, to essentially cover our sins and have our sins uh, forgiven. We are also told that the sacrifices must be perfect and without blemish. This is very important also to keep in mind. So I'm going to minimize this because seeing myself twice kind of freaks me out. Um, <clears throat> We're also told that the sacrifices right, must be perfect and without blemish. So a, a sacrifice can't be imperfect, essentially, right? So we understand that the atonement and the way to become uh, righteous before God is through blood, which life is in the blood and has been given as an atonement for us. That's in Leviticus 17, 11. Um, so we know that this sacrifice must be perfect. Uh, and we are told that God it also in several other passages is our only savior, right? This is key and critical for us to understand is in the fact that God is our only savior. So if a person, right, or a Messiah or Jesus comes and is considered to be and claims to be and demonstrates himself to be our ultimate savior, we can only conclude one particular thing, right? And that one particular thing is that, drum roll please, Jesus the Messiah is God himself. If he were not, then he could not be the savior. <clears throat> so, before sending an Adam and Eve out of paradise, God says this to them about the woman. He says her, Eve's offspring, will strike Satan's head and Satan will bruise his heel. Right. This is a very, very important passage, and this is part of what we're going to conclude here in a little bit. So this sets up the premise. Right. The premise is... Um, there's a sin problem, right? We already know the problem. We know that the three main characters, God, Satan, mankind. Um, and then we know the idea, right? Which is to reconcile mankind uh, with, with and to God, right? And God says this, there's going to be some, uh, your offspring, the woman is going to bear an offspring who is going to essentially destroy Satan, <laughs> So the saga includes many different candidates, right? So as we read throughout the Old Testament, we think, oh, maybe it could be Abel or Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or Moses or Joshua or Hezekiah or David or Solomon, right? So there's a lot of different candidates that arise um, that have some markings that could potentially make them the saviors, right? But as we all know, None of them are successful. But this is what's interesting about each one of those particular characters is different aspects of their lives, both in their successes 
and where they failed, where Jesus succeeds, are foreshadow are foreshadows of who the true Messiah or the true Savior is going to be. <clears throat> so there are essentially way too many uh, messianic prophecies for me to go through in this particular discussion. We'd be here for weeks, months, years on end. It would be forever and ever, essentially. Um, but there are quite a few that I'm going to list that I consider to be key prophecies. And this will help us paint the picture of who the Messiah is. So one key passage is found in Isaiah 7.14, and this specifically relates to what God said about the woman having the offspring, right? The offspring, which is going to crush the head of Satan. We also need to keep in mind that God is the only Savior, okay? So this is a really important prophecy. So Isaiah 7.14 uh, says, The Lord himself, Yahweh himself, shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear you a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, right? Which we all know means God with us. So we learn three main things from this one little passage, and it's so critically important, especially when we reflect on what God said to Eve regarding her offspring, right? So Yahweh will provide the son, right? What does this mean? Well, this pretty much tells us that there will be no earthly father. It is, it is Yahweh himself who will provide the child to a virgin, right? So through the woman prophesied to Eve, I already said this, uh, the, sh the Savior shall come. And what's really important for us to remember is what he'll be known as. He'll be known as God with us. If you don't understand this, ask a question, but it seems pretty straightforward to me. This means that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. His father, right, essentially will be Yahweh. Um, and what he will do, he's, the, he's essentially the promised son uh, or the promised offspring through Eve. And he will be actually God, Emmanuel, with us. Other key passages, David writes in Psalm 22 about how the Messiah will suffer. He will have his hands and his feet pierced. He will be mocked. He will be, uh, he'll have his clothes. The people will cast lots for his clothing, which is exactly what we read about when we see the passion narrative, right? We see that Jesus is beaten. He's mocked. He's crucified, which includes piercing of the hands and the feet. We even see little details about how they cast lots, um, to select who got the clothes of Jesus. And this is what exactly happened to Jesus. And this is why he quotes the first line of Psalm 22. He's pointing to that particular Psalm, telling them to go look at that scripture. And you will see, right, in real time, when Jesus is speaking this, people would be able to witness exactly what Psalm 22 was prophesying and how that is fulfilled within the Messiah within Jesus on the cross. Another key passage, nobody's going to be surprised here, Isaiah 53, which talks about the Messiah uh, known as the suffering servant. The suffering servant is going to be bearing the sins of the people. And through his suffering, uh, he is going to relieve the guilty of their sins and, for, and they will be forgiven through his sacrifice, right? I think just with these few examples, these three examples, uh, Isaiah 714, Psalm 22, um, and Isaiah 53, you get a really good picture about what the expectations are within the Old Testament about who the Messiah is, how they're going to reconcile mankind to God, how they're going to be born through a virgin, how they are going to actually be God themselves in the name of Emmanuel, how they're going to suffer, how they're going to die, how that perfect, unblemished sacrifice is going to reconcile us to God. <clears throat> we'll also read about the Messiah is to be a new covenant, right? Given to the people. We read about this in Jeremiah 31, right? Not just he will be the, he, it, it's not that he will usher in a new covenant, right? He will be the new covenant, which I believe we also see in Isaiah 42, uh, we see uh, written in the book of Daniel that there's this divine figure known as the Son of Man. 
he's depicted as a cloud rider, which is the it would so being the cloud rider is a big deal. That's only ever attributed to Yahweh as being the cloud rider, and yet here we see this divine son of man also being the cloud rider. We're starting to see a greater picture of the the plurality that we see in God through Genesis one, right? And he and him, and he makes them, you know, in his image. Uh, but also when he uses, uh, you know, us and our uh, image as well, right? So we're under, we're starting to understand through this progressive revelation that we see throughout the Old Testament, that God is a, a, a cod, right? God is one, uh, but he is also uh, in that sense of oneness there's also a plurality right and as trinitarians we totally understand uh that the plurality is in persons not in different gods so to speak right so so the oneness is in the essence and the plurality is in the persons of that essence now a little bit off topic here but we could go on and on about how to rationalize this and make this um you know, a, a logical thing, but really at the end of the day, the Bible tells us very clearly that God is one. Uh, and it also clearly tells us that the father is God, the son is God and the Holy spirit is God that completely fulfills the understanding it, that answers the questions when it comes to, uh, Genesis one with the he statements and the us and our statements. <clears throat> So we got the cloud rider. Uh, we have the person being the covenant for the people. And then uh, we also could touch on things like Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Um, we could read different passages about John the Baptist, especially when it relates to Isaiah and is it uh, Micah, I believe, and how there's going to be <clears throat> a messenger crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way. Uh, for Yahweh. Um, and then we can clearly see that John the Baptist identifies himself as the messenger calling out in the wilderness, clearing the or preparing the way for Yahweh. Uh, and then we see, you know, the way I picture it in my mind is, you know, I'm preparing the way for Yahweh and then overcome, you know, overwalks Jesus over top of a hill. And he's like, look, there he is. There's Yahweh. Um, we could uh, also talk about things uh, like the sign of Jonah and how that applies to things. And we can go on and on and on. Uh, but really what I wanted to do at this particular point, um, full armor apologetics, what's up, Alonzo, what's up? Uh, my uh, interlocutor, Alonzo, did not um, show up. We've been trying to do this for a long time and he just didn't show up. So uh, just to kind of summarize all of this uh, for you, and I was hoping that we could get into a discussion with him at that particular point, right? But the character of God... Uh, th this is how I'm going to summarize it, right? We see that the character of God, which we've hit on, is is both singular and plural in, in different senses, right? A We read that a promised divine son will uh, reconcile mankind to God. He will defeat uh, Satan and, and he will defeat evil. And then we will get this reconciliation. Um, we read that God is the only savior. We read that the Messiah, the Messiah is the savior um for us to conclude oh sorry i can't read my own writing which i wrote like three minutes ago uh the messiah is the savior and uh reconciles us uh to god and he is known as emmanuel right so the messiah is going to be god with us uh the messiah will be born of a virgin known as god with us like i said the messiah will suffer uh and the Messiah will suffer as an atonement, as a reconciliation for all of us. The Messiah will himself be a new covenant. And Jesus uh, clearly fulfills all of this criteria as being not only the Messiah, but the divine Messiah. Um, so that was basically the preparation that I had for the, the opening statement to get this conversation started. Uh, I've got quite a bit of other notes. Uh, I'll go through that, uh, not only for the like three or four people watching live, but for the, you know, however many people watch this later, because I find it very interesting how the new Testament uses so much of the old Testament as part of the revelation to say, look, all of these things that you read about, right? All of the things that the Jewish people were studying, um, 
uh, they were they were you know uh, speculating about you know how is this going to be fulfilled. Well, clearly, as I said at the beginning, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's clearly uh, fulfilled within Jesus. We get a clear picture of the singularity and the plurality use of God. We understand why God said uh, to Eve that he will basically give her uh, the, the offspring that will crush the head of Satan. We pull into perspective the Isaiah passage about the virgin conceiving uh, and his name being Emmanuel or God. With us, the New Testament authors draw on all of this. They explain it much more in detail, oftentimes using, uh, they are uh, recording Jesus' own words in this particular sense. Um, so a couple other notes that I had prepared um, is just to draw into perspective how in Genesis, right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth right? We, we, we see that passage. And then we see in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, right? So he's expanding upon this. So the, the word is the logos and uh, the word was with God and the word was God, right? So we're, we're seeing that there's this, there's this separation in persons, right? We see the character of God. We see the character of the logos or the word, and we see that they are um, somehow distinct. But then we also learn that the word is God at the same time, right? So when we when we go back into Genesis and we read it through later Revelation, especially what, what John is saying here, it all starts to make sense. <clears throat> so um, Jesus says, uh, you know, the Son of Man must suffer many things and he must be killed and on the third day raised again, right? So this is the, the, the sign of Jonah. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written, but woe to the man of whom the Son of Man is betrayed, right? So we see this clearly over and over again, uh, that Jesus is prophesying his, his own death. He's explaining to us uh, through his life story um, that he is the, the Savior, he is the Messiah, he is God among us, and he is the one who is able to uh, rectify us and save us and bring us back into right standing and right relationship uh, with God. <clears throat> It, we see, uh, I talked about earlier about Jeremiah uh, and how uh, he will be a new covenant for the people. Well, Jesus says this clearly uh, in Matthew and I believe also in Luke. Uh, he's This is the Last Supper. Um, this is, you know, the, the, the Eucharist. Uh, he says, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, right? So Jesus himself is the new covenant, right? So clearly he's a Messiah. Clearly he's God among us. Clearly God is the only savior. And Jesus is saying that through his blood, right? Um, blood is the atonement uh, and it is given as, uh, or blood is a, a, an atonement given for you, right? So Jesus is fulfilling all of these things in these particular statements. Um, so I got a lot of this stuff kind of covered. I got a lot of this covered. Um, you know, Jesus uh, reads the Isaiah scroll, right? And he, and he prophesies that in the reading this, in this moment of hearing it, the scripture has been fulfilled, right? So we see over and over again in Jesus' life how he is saying that he has been fulfilling uh, all of these different prophecies. Um, Isaiah 42 says the, the servant will be a covenant for the people again. And in the songs... Uh, in the end of Isaiah 53, we talked about this, the Messiah will suffer and die for sins of all of his people. Um, we talked about Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, we have not yet talked about how Jesus was identified as John, from John the Baptist as the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world. Um, Mark identifies, I, I hit on this a little bit, as Jesus, as Yahweh via uh, John declaring that he is the voice calling into the wilderness. Uh, we talked about, sorry, I'm just, I'm literally just reading my notes here. Um, we, we talked about the uh, first sin and how uh, he was promised. Um, let's see, I'm just going to read this really quickly and see if there's anything else I want to add to it. I don't want to just keep uh, repeating myself. <laughs> Uh, let's do this as well. I said I was going to hit on some of this uh, in the discussion. So Abraham is ordered to offer his son, his only son, as a sacrifice who the Bible identifies as Isaac. Isaac then turns to his father when they're journeying up to, this, the, uh, to, to the mountain for the sacrifice. Isaac says, 
where is the sacrifice? To which Abraham replies, this is key and critical, God will provide the sacrifice, is what Abraham says, right? So Abraham is about to go up. He is about to sacrifice his son, his only son, right? Um, and yet Abraham has this faith that God will provide the sacrifice. This ties back into the Lamb of God. Uh, so God stops him. We all know this story. And all of a sudden, you know, he sees a ram caught in thickets. Uh, and this is a partial fulfillment of Abraham's prophecy. God will provide the sacrifice. My son, to which uh, John the Baptist um, says more about, and he says, look, this is the sacrifice that God has prepared. This is the Lamb of God. This is not only takes away the sin of like the one person who sacrifices it. He says, Jesus is the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Right, so this Jesus clearly fulfills this. He is God's only Son. Uh, he He is the the eternal. He is the perfect, the unblemished sacrifice that that forgives the sins of the world. Essentially, giving us the ability to enter back into paradise and to right relationship uh, with God. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty self evident here. Uh, let's see if there's anyone. Oh, yes, of course. I can't believe I forgot this one, right? We can talk about the serpent on the pole, one of my favorite, one of my favorite passages that Jesus is talking about here. Um, we uh, before I get into that, sorry, one one more note here. Um, so Jesus is uh, also fulfills the Passover lamb right? who sacrificed uh, during the Passover festival, um, who in in the written in the first Passover, right? that was that was the final. It was the final straw for Pharaoh before he released um, God's people so that they could go back to the promised land. Uh, whereas G Jesus fulfills this as the final sacrifice, as the perfect sacrifice, the, the lamb of God, the sacrifice uh, to take away the sins of the world. Uh, and it's not only are we given, we're not just given freedom uh, in within this world, right? We are given uh, f ultimate freedom and release from our sins so that we can enter not just into the promised land, but back into paradise so that we can live in the presence of God, which is the most amazing, the most amazing thing that could ever, ever be done to us. And what's amazing too, is we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it, right? We can't cover our own sins. We can't build a tower to heaven. We can't, uh, you know, cover our shame with fig leaves or something. There's just something we can't do, right? Because we are not the saviors. Only God is the savior. <clears throat> Back to the Moses lifting up the serpent, right? So in, in John chapter three, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so too must the son of man be lifted up the cross for all who saw the serpent of the pool were saved right from the from the sting of the poison of the snake this is representative of sin so too will all those who look upon uh, the son of man who will be lifted up on a pole which we later see uh, the pole itself is the cross and all who believe in him are saved from the eternal death right we're all going to face uh, a mortal death but our souls will continue to live on eternally one direction or another and if we have accepted christ as our lord and savior the most beautiful thing is that we can live in the presence of of god um <clears throat> a couple other little fulfilled things right so jesus was crucified uh, as he said he was going to be this fulfills um the the prophecy which i just talked about lifting up the serpent on the pool psalm 22 isaiah 53 uh, he'll be buried in a rich man's tomb he will crush satan's head underfoot his heel will be bruised right indicating uh what what happened to him on the cross he'll be lashed for our sins by his stripes we were healed right he was he was beaten with the cat of nine tails those are those are particularly lashings um and he will cover us from death, right? The death is the spiritual death that we're talking about as the Lamb of God fulfilling the Passover Lamb uh, prophecy. What's cool is Jesus didn't stay dead, right? We all know that. Um, his days were extended as promised uh, in the Psalms and in Isaiah. Uh, he also prophesied, he said the only, you know, when he's talking to the Pharisees, that the sign you're going to be given is the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights. So too will the Son of Man 
uh, be in the belly or the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And we know that Jonah uh, was a type of resurrection, right? When he was spit out by the fish onto uh, the beach, I suppose. And uh, Jesus, of course, resurrecting on the third day, indicating that uh, he fulfilled that prophecy. He is God. We've talked about all of those things already. Uh, we talked about coming on the clouds of heaven. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all I had uh, specifically prepared. I was hoping that we could have um, some more interaction so we could get into it. Um, I do have a little bit of time to take a few questions. Let me see if we have any questions. I'm going to scroll up here real quick. I don't ever pay attention uh, to these things. Uh, da, da, da. Well, I'm just going to put a few few comments up here. Um, so Dragon, Dragon is an amazing sister. Um, she has an amazing voice, an amazing heart and love for God. Um, and she is one of the greatest prayer warriors I've ever, I've ever come across in my life. Uh, she also has her own YouTube channel where she reads through different biblical passages and things like that. So if you want to join her on that, I highly suggest doing it. God bless you, sister. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I saw basically everybody just saying, hey, hey to dragon. Um, all right. So we got JD here. Welcome JD. I'm going to lengthen this out a little bit so you guys can see it. Do the Jews think the Messiah is divine or just a man who comes in time to save them? So that's a really good question, JD. Um, we, we all kind of commit this fallacy. All of us do myself included. And, and, and the fallacy is assuming, um, that the Jews are monolithic right? That they have one particular belief system. No Jew has ever deviated from that one particular belief system. No Jew has ever been heretical, you know, no, none of that, right? So um, that that's one premise I'd like to kind of lay out there is there's a lot of different uh, belief systems. We can read about them uh, through ancient writings, the Talmuds, Mishnah, all those different things. Uh, we can read about it from a historical perspective that uh, Jewish people had a lot of different beliefs about who the Messiah was going to be. Uh, some of the more common ones is that he was going to basically just be David himself, right? He was going to um, <clears throat> come, he was going to win battles, he was going to free Israel, he was going to rule and reign, uh, basically just like David did. Um, and especially during the time of Jesus, a lot of people, uh, because of the, the Roman oppression, a lot of people were hoping for someone to rise up you know, yield a sword, uh, get an army and conquer, conquer Rome, essentially, and usher in the, the, the time of the Messiah. Uh, present, uh, the, one of the more common present Jewish perspectives, and probably the one that you're mentioning, um, that most of us are aware of is, is the Jews say, you know, look, you'll know when the Messiah comes, because there will be world peace. That's, that's the most common response that I get from uh, contemporary Jewish people. Um, but you know, these are contemporary Jewish people. These are post-Christian movements. Uh, and we can actually see throughout history how historically um, the, the Christian thought, right, which was an early, which was a, a, at the very beginning was considered to just be a, a Jewish movement, at an extension of Judaism uh, to, you know, the destruction of the temple uh, and the Jewish people moving essentially away. We see this evolution of, of a, a very similar uh, theology to Christianity, um, where they just, just deny that Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Although clearly lots and lots of Jewish people at that time did believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of it. And as you probably know, all of the disciples were Jewish, you know, most of their earlier fall earliest followers were Jewish. And then Paul comes around and starts, um, you know, preaching to, uh, the, all the other nations and, and the Gentiles, um, <clears throat> so to, to kind of sum it all up here, um, there was a lot of, uh, we call it second temple Judaism. Uh, there's a couple of books written on this speci uh, specific topic, talking about the expectation of the Messiah being divine. Uh, a lot of different, um, understandings about the nature of, of God, not just one, everybody agrees that God is one in, in, in essence, 
uh, but even Jewish people. Um, I believe there's a book called Two Powers in, in Heaven, um, which talks about, you know, it, it, it's a historical perspective from, you know, reading the different writings of, of different Jewish people, uh, how they, they believe that there was essentially two, two powers in heaven, this d d divine son of man and um, uh, essentially is this, this heavenly, heavenly father. So um, not to drone on and on too much about it. Um, so I think some, some Jewish people think that the thought that the Messiah would be divine. Um, I think some Jewish sects, and you can see actually some weird cult sects where um, the Jewish people do follow um, someone who they believe to be the Messiah and believe to also be divine. You can see some writings, even post-Christianity, uh, of speculations of their Messiah uh, being divine, and then other ones just out out. Uh, I would say the majority of Jewish people in contemporary times just outright deny um, that the Messiah could possibly be uh, divine. They're much more Unitarian uh, now in their in their thought process than they were um, prior to the time of Jesus and and slightly after the the time of Jesus. Uh, JD, you brought up another interesting statement, um, so I'm going to preface this with uh this is all purely speculative right so as we talked about uh at my very opening line to to this discussion was hindsight is 2020 especially when it comes to to prophecy right so um most of us are going to look at um you know like the olivet discourse with jesus uh, a couple of uh, uh chapters that paul writes uh and then most of us are going to go straight to revelation um, you know, sounds like the Antichrist who brings false peace, right? So I, I think you might be on to something. Again, this is completely speculative, although Revelation does say the Antichrist will bring some degree of world peace. Um, I could speculate all day long about how um, the Mahdi, which is e essentially, um, it's, it's the, the, uh, the Islamic perspective of um, somebody who's going to kind of be against uh, the the Antichrist, their particular Antichrist, and their particular Antichrist is similar to our Christ. There's a um, there's a John MacArthur I think did a did a sermon or a sermon series on this particular thing, kind of comparing um, the eschatology of Islam to the eschatology of a lot of Christians. Um, although there's differences within Christians on eschatology and there's differences within Islam as of, of eschatology. Um, and essentially the, the world peace bringer um, is somebody that the Muslims are going to follow. They're going to believe that that is the, the Christ or the Mahdi. Um, and uh, it, it could potentially work out that uh, the, the contemporary Jewish people might assume that that same figure uh, is their actual Messiah, right? So clearly the Antichrist is going to be very, um, very deceptive. Um, he's going to be very likable. He's going to be followed by lots and lots and lots of people. If he wasn't followed by lots of people, there really wouldn't be a battle. There wouldn't be an Armageddon. There wouldn't be all those types of things. Um, so clearly uh, the, the world's going to be progressing in such a way to allow for someone uh, like that to arise into power and to be followed by many people. Uh, there's not a ton of Jews uh, in, in the world now, but there are quite a few Muslims out there. So, um, and the, a lot of Muslims, at least here in America, in political power have aligned themselves with the liberal left. Um, so if you want to go down a big, long rabbit hole, I could go do that. But uh, for, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to agree with you. It does sound like the, uh, the, the, it might be the Antichrist who brings false peace. Um, if anybody else has any questions or comments they'd like to add, um, I'll stay on here for just a little bit and answer a few of them. Otherwise, just to keep this video short and let people actually want to watch it, um, I'll jump off of here. So I'll give you guys just a little bit of time. I know there's a lag in the comment section um, relative to when I'm speaking in real time. Uh, so I'll give a give a few more moments here before I uh, jump off of here. Um, so yeah, let me pull up this other thing as well. Let's see, I don't know if all the comments make it through. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I don't see anything else coming through. Um, 
so uh, I just want to thank you for watching. If, if you're here with me live, thank you guys so much for, for coming and hanging out. Uh, God, God bless you guys so much. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, if you are not yet a Christian, I pray for you. I pray that you, um, ask, seek and knock and try to find the truth because I promise you, if you are genuinely seeking after the heart of God, that he will reveal himself to you. And I genuinely believe that, um, when God reveals himself to you, he will reveal himself as the way, the truth and the life. And that is exactly who Jesus is says that he is thank you guys so much for watching as you already know jesus loves you have a fantastic day